so I hope you had an awesome keynote. I got here a bit late, but I hear it involved robots and jetpacks. And so one of the guys, while wiring me up, said, good luck following that, which is just what you want to hear before speaking to a large audience. Uh, but thanks for coming along today. Unfortunately, the conference looks awesome, and I'm literally here for this talk because I am bad at scheduling. So hopefully, if my flight is taking off from Brussels, depending on what Lufthansa is doing, I will be shooting off straight from here. Uh, my name's Sam Newman. I work for a company called ThoughtWorks. If you don't know what we do, you can email me or look us up on the net, because we're on the internet now. Um, and uh, I'm also the author of a book called Building Microservices. If you enjoy the talk, there are copies of the book available at the O'Reilly stand, um, which you can find later on. Uh, but we're actually here to talk about these things, because they are all the rage. Uh, the only thing um, more buzzwordy in 2015 than microservices is, of course, Docker. Um, I'm sure lots of you have Docker stickers on your laptop. I'm sure some of those stick people with Docker stickers on their laptops have even run Docker. Um, but this is what we're here to talk about, and these are microservices. I draw them as hexagons because it's a nice shape, and they're my slides, and I get to pick the shapes. Uh, but also as an homage to uh, Alistair Coburn's paper on hexagonal architecture, they have names. Uh, customer service, shipping, inventory, these, these give you an idea what the architecture might be about. And this is the definition I use for them. Uh, small autonomous services that work together modeled around a business domain. I normally say small independently releasable uh, services that work together modeled around a business domain. You might have your own definition of microservices, and that's great, and then you can put that in your own book. Uh, but this is what I say they are. They are separate processes. They communicate over a network port, but they're all actually about independent evolution. They're about being able to make a change and deploy them into production by themselves. And so I spent a lot of time working with organizations because I come from a background of having spent a good chunk of the last 10 years of my career working with service-oriented architectures. Um, so I see microservices as nothing more or nothing less than an opinionated form of service-oriented architectures. And so I was sort of intrigued as to why microservices worked and what it was that organizations had to do to make these things work well. There are a lot of downsides that come from microservices. There's a lot of complexity that we add. How do you sort of chart a path through all around the pitfalls and get the valuable stuff out of it? Um, one of my uh, colleagues, James Lewis, sort of talks about microservices in the context of a an architecture that buys options for you. That is to say, you invest in having these smaller, finer-grained architectures, and in exchange for which, you get the ability to make lots of different choices. And choices can be good. But when we come from a background of working with more monolithic software, often we only get used to making one or two major decisions a year. We have one main technology stack we use for that monolithic system. We maybe only have one type of persistence um, store. Maybe only one type of main idiomatic um, design used in that system. With a microservice architecture, you get to make a lot more choices. And this can actually be a source of a large amount of friction. As always, when you make decisions, if you sort of approach every single one from scratch, thinking about the pros and cons, it can become a bit exhausting to go through this the whole time. And also, it can lead to situations where you end up sort of making different decisions in similar situations, and you end up with a whole amount of sort of inconsistencies in your architectures. Quite often, we use a set of framing principles to help guide our decision making, like a set of value statements that sort of decide how we do something around here. So for example, Heroku have their 12 factors. The key thing about Heroku's 12 factors, these are principles that guide decision making when working on the Heroku platform. It's actually, you know, all these sets of principles are to achieve some goal. So this stuff, when you follow it well, hopefully your application will work well on the Heroku platform. There's actually a mix of principles so design decisions and constraints, the constraints of the Heroku platform itself. But nonetheless, when you're building a platform on Heroku, a system on Heroku, this guides your decision making, this set of principles. Uh, this was a set of principles done by a colleague of mine, Evan Botcher. 
Um, and sort of the things we talk about in terms of architectural principles, typically, are sort of what you see in this central column. Um, but Evan really highlighted the fact here that these principles, these things that drive how we're going to design our software, they exist for a reason. And here, they exist to drive the company forward. So here on the sort of um, leftmost column, we've got a description of what the organization is trying to do. This is an organization that's trying to go fast. They're trying to expand rapidly into new markets. The architectural principles, therefore, are about going fast. There's much less emphasis on being consistent. Um, there's much more emphasis on actually just empowering teams. And then over on the right, Evan has pulled out as distinct from principles these idea of practices. These are mechanisms by which you implement a principle. Evan made the observation that your, where your company is going doesn't change that often. Maybe once a year, once every two years. Our architectural principles, they change a bit more. We learn stuff. We realize that some of our decisions weren't great. And that, that maybe modifies on a, on a slightly more frequent cycle. And then over here on the right, the practices, the things that are actually the detail, they change quite a bit because technology changes all the time. But nonetheless, by breaking these things apart, this actually allowed this sort of large-ish organization, they now have over 200 developers, to more or less have a good sense of how things are done around here. And they also make sure these principles are driving towards an end goal, this end goal being this company being successful. The 12 factors for Heroku have an end goal. Your application should work on Heroku. So when I was doing my research into microservices, I was thinking one of the things that organizations do in order to achieve their end goal, which is namely they get enough of the good stuff out of microservices for it to be worthwhile. So what are the principles that we need to follow to build these things, these small autonomous services that work together? So I've sort of distilled it down. I mean, uh, uh, it's sort of a, it's an earlier version of this in the book, and this is sort of a newer version of this. Distill it down to eight principles. The first is modeling things around a business domain because we found that that gives us more stable APIs. Embracing a culture of automation to manage the fact that we've now got a lot more deployable units. Hiding implementation details to allow one service to evolve independently of another. Decentralizing as much as possible, both sort of decision-making power, but also architectural design concepts. Deploying independently, probably the most important principle up there, the idea that you can make a change to a service and deploy it into production without having to make changes to anything else. Consumer first, services, it turns out, exist to be called, and maybe we should think about that. So thinking outside in, not inside out. Isolating failure making sure that the systems we build are not you know, sort of more flaky than their monolithic counterparts, which is very easy to do, and making sure our systems are highly observable, making sure it's easy to understand how they hang together and how they behave. So let's dive into the uh, first principle, modeling things around a business domain. I said earlier that I draw these things you know, as hexagons. The more important thing are the names. They have names that have meaning. When you look at an architecture for a microservice system, you should have some idea of the domain in which it operates. Compare that to a lot of the architectures that we saw coming out of the service-oriented architecture, where people took the sort of horizontal technical layers within a process boundary and just said, right, they're going to become new services. And so we ended up with presentation services. We ended up with sort of business logic services and back-end data storage services. The nice thing about those architectures is that you can use exactly the same architecture diagram for an oil rig, a banking system, or a charity, because it's the same diagram. It's not very useful, though, because often when you want to make a change with those systems that have been split horizontally, a change often has to cut all the way through. Something as simple as adding a new field to a user interface may require changes in two or three services. And when those services are owned by teams, that's coordination across teams. With microservices, instead of slicing things horizontally, we're sort of slicing things vertically. The unit of decomposition is effectively the business domain. We found that services modeled around a business domain are much more stable. That is, the APIs themselves don't tend to change fundamentally that often. Changes across service boundaries are expensive, so we want to avoid them. 
We also find that we've ex by exposing these finer grained seams, it makes it easier for us to create different sorts of user interfaces because we can recombine the functionality in different ways for a mobile device, for a web application. And also that teams that own these services become experts in that part of the business domain. Rather than becoming an expert in some arbitrary technical decomposition of the whole, we now get teams that are really understand how invoicing works, understand how the accounts process works. Finding these seams in existing monolithic systems can be difficult, um, but there's a lot of work from domain-driven design that can help us here. In many ways, the same principles that apply to modern decomposition from the 70s still apply, um, but taken with a health, healthy dose of uh, domain-driven design thinking as well, helping us look for things like bounded contexts and subdomains, you can actually find these service boundaries. So implementing domain-driven design is a good place to start if you're interested in using this as a way of understanding the domain you're operating in. Let's talk about our next principle, so embracing a culture of automation. You need to be pretty relentless about this if you're going to use microservices at scale. At the moment, when you're starting on this journey, having a small number of services, you could probably get away with manually provisioning of machines, manual deployments. That won't last. So let's talk about one of a client of ours who's been using microservices for many years, and we're using it before we had the word for it. Um, this is a company called REA in Australia. They'd actually spent a couple of years investing in a deployment platform uh, on Amazon, primarily to allow them to cheaply provision test and dev environments. But they already had a fairly good set of rigor and discipline around automation. But they wanted to go a bit further and embrace this sort of Amazon idea of the two pizza team. Services being owned and operated by teams. That team deploys the infrastructure, deploys the service, manages that service in production, and then actually tears that service down when it's no longer needed. So from a standing start, they got three of these services, uh, sorry, two of these services up into production inside of three months, which is actually, I think, very good going. I think most organizations wouldn't necessarily get that thing turned around as quickly as they did. That went really well for them, and they thought, right, we're really going to go fast now. We think we can ramp this up. It took them another nine months just to get seven more services up because they had to invest all the way along in tooling and creating a platform that allows them to do this efficiently. All this is about reducing the transaction cost of having and managing more services. And it's not always easy to see what things you're going to need when you start that journey. And so actually you see a fairly flat growth here. Six months later, they had 60 services in production. The key thing to understand is this is 60 different types of services. These services themselves may further be scaled out. So you see this sort of hockey stick explosion in the growth of services. You see similar growth patterns from Gilt, who have shared their numbers of growth over time. That organization, you've kind of gone from a monolithic Rails application to sort of a decomposed, often JVM-based platform. You see similar patterns. For many years, they had a low double-digit number of services. But once that sufficient investment in the platform kicked in, things spiked up. And so when we're thinking about automation, we're thinking about things like infrastructure automation. Can I write a line of code and provision an isolated operating system or provision a service? Have I got sufficient testing in place that, makes, that, that, that helps me understand whether or not I can release my software? And am I treating every check-in as a release candidate? Have I really got rigor around that stuff? All of this is the things you're going to have to invest in if you want to use these things at scale and be relentless there will be some upfront work required to get this working, and that will require ongoing investment as well. Let's talk now about one of the trickiest things to get right, which is actually hiding implementation details. So we're in a very small, cozy environment here. This is a very safe space. There's only one or two or 600 of my closest friends. So I feel confident in sharing with you the world's most commonly used service integration pattern outside of the internet, and that is this. I have a service that talks to a database. This is OK. I'm OK with this. This is fine. Databases are good things. But I want to spin up another service, and so I do this. It's very easy to do. It's very quick to do. This now allows two services to share information. This is, this is very common. Two services, it's not too bad, but it is quite bad. If I want to make a change to a schema 
maybe rename a column because the name is bad, maybe restructure a schema to achieve different performance targets. Can I do that safely, knowing that other parties are reaching in and, and, and looking at my database? And the answer is that I can't do that safely. Effectively, when you expose a database to another service in this way, you have exposed internal implementation details. You don't get to decide what is shared and what is hidden. And with two services, things aren't too bad. I worked on a platform where we had 40 separate services integrated on a schema that we owned. We couldn't track down who all those people were. So we had to turn the database off during the day and wait for phone calls. Right, this drastically impacts your ability to change and evolve the design of your system. So this is what we want to talk about. If you want to talk, get information from another service, or you want to change data it holds, you need to make a request in some way. You need to make an API call. You need to send a, a message to it. In this way, at the API layer, people owning that service get to decide what is hidden and what is not hidden, which allows them to change the internals of that system safely. So hide your databases. This will be one of the biggest things to get right in allowing these services to evolve independently. But even once we've done that, even once we've sort of got a nice API boundary, we still have to think about what that API shares as well. I mentioned the, uh, some of the ideas behind domain-driven design earlier. There's one thing we talk about when we're talking about service design and domain-driven design, and that's this idea of the bounded contexts. The bounded context is sort of an explicit boundary within a domain, and that you have models that you share between those boundaries, and then you have models which only really need to exist inside one of those boundaries. This is an example from Martin Fowler's um, uh, post on, on bounded context. So, on the left here, we have a collection of functionality around sales. We have concepts in there. We have territory pipeline opportunity. On the right, we have a bunch of stuff about support. We have things about defect, product versions, tickets. The nice thing about having diagrams like this, again, is that you get a sense of what the domain might be. It was quite useful. So there are, but there are two things that are shared. There's customer and product. The thing to understand here is that what customer means inside a sales context is different to what customer means within inside a support context, although it might be the same person. A customer in sales is somebody I have sold to or might sell to. A customer in the context of support is somebody's rate a ticket. So when you're thinking about sharing information, you've got to really understand what do I really need to share? What is the information that actually anyone else does care about? Because let's imagine if these were two service boundaries, how I might implement this. I have an object which is the customer. It has fields so I can see information about it, maybe the tickets that they've raised and the defects. They're there as little fields in the object. I run my serializer on it to transform it into a highly efficient and very human readable format like JSON. Slight troll. Um, and it runs and follows all the references and creates this nice, big JSON payload. And I send that over the wire. And it's sent along with it the tickets. It's sent along with it the defects that person has raised, and so on and so forth. When you expose internals like that, again, it becomes very, very hard to change. Exposing information is costly. It's easier to expose information you've previously hidden and hide information you've previously exposed. So you also need to think very carefully about what is shared and what is hidden. That's often what a lot of the bounded context ideas are about. Let's talk now about more, maybe one more of the fuzzier ideas here. And that's all, you know, that's about decentralizing all the things. The reason this is important is because microservices are an architecture which optimizes around autonomy, autonomy of teams, predominantly rather than individuals, but autonomy nonetheless. To do this, to achieve that uh, hoped goal of going faster, deploying quickly and more quickly into production, you have to actually push power out. When we're thinking about what autonomy is, sort of the definition I use in this context is sort of giving people as much freedom as possible to do the job at hand. And so we need to think, what can we do to make our developers, make the teams owning these services more in control of their own destiny? It starts with things like self-service. Do I have to raise a ticket to get a machine or provision an environment, or can I just do it myself? Um, that's a very simple thing. Governance is also important. 
I actually think governance is not a dirty word necessarily. Having a place where people can collectively come together, look at how things, look at the cross-cutting concerns, understand, okay, do our principles need to change? Um, but finding a way for that governance process to be shared as well. So rather than having some centralized architect who sits over the whole thing, you actually have people that come together, collective, you know, members of the team that come together and talk and share ideas. Some organizations create this with, say, things like the uh, shared communities of practice. Uh, this is actually a reference to the slide here. It's referencing a blog post from Gilt from a couple of years ago. Uh, the structure they talk about here didn't really stick for very long, but nonetheless, it's an interesting example of how you can have a bit more of a collective sense of governance and ownership. But it also comes into our architectures. How many people have an architecture like this? Hands up, anybody? A nice, simple bus, magical bus, that communicates and manages the communication of all our services. And it looks like a nice diagram. The problem, of course, is that often it's hiding a lot of problems. So I have no problems against message brokers. I have no problems with things that get messages from A to B and do so in a resilient and reliable way. A large amount of my uh, IT career has been spent using such things but I don't like it when those message brokers start taking on more and more functionality and more and more behavior. You know, IBM MQ series was a good queue in 1995, but they kept adding things on top. We do things like make these buses domain aware. We use them to implement consistent data models. We start putting more and more smarts into this wonderful magical mystery bus in the middle. And Suddenly, to make a change, we need to not just change the service, but also the message bus itself, which is now being managed by a separate team. If you're going to use middleware, if you're going to use messaging middleware, keep it dumb. Keep it about the pipe. Keep it about going from A to B. Keep the smarts in the services. And this does not just apply to messaging middleware. I think if you look at the current trend around API gateways, they are fast becoming the enterprise service bus of the microservice era. Because the reality is, when we look inside these things, they look nice on the surface, but we know there's some sort of hellish landscape of death and destruction lying just within the surface. <laughs> so, which is the halfway point now, let's talk about probably the most important principle, and that is deploying independently. This is the idea that it should be the norm, not the exception that you make a change to a service and deploy it into production without changing anything else. If you have five services right now and you always have to deploy, deploy all of those five services together, fix that before you add a sixth. You'll thank me later. Getting this right can require a lot of things. But it can often start with even simple things like how are your services mapped to the underlying infrastructure? Things like, you know, how many services per host do you have? When I say the word host here, I'm really talking about an isolated operating system and sort of collection of resources. That could be a physical machine, it could be a virtual machine, it could be a container. We have the model where I have one service per host, or the model where I have, oh, I skipped forward too quickly, or multiple services per host. Over here on the right, where I have multiple services per host, this is the world you'll be in if you're, say, using a Java application container. This is where you're using JBoss. This is where you're using IIS. Um, this is often an approach that's optimizing about having a small number of hosts. This is the world you'll be in if the cost of provisioning a new host is too high. So if you only have physical infrastructure or you have to raise lots of tickets to provision a virtual machine. The issue is that world on the right is a world of side effects. That world on the right is where I deploy a service, it has a bug that uses up all the CPU on the machine and suddenly all the other services stop working. That's where I deploy some prerequisites that a service needs on that machine, and suddenly those prerequisites, don't, they clash with the other services on that box, and those other services stop working. The world on the right is more confusing to think about from an operations point of view, and doesn't really help us around interdependence. You don't have to start with one service per host. But I think virtually everybody I've met who uses microservices at scale, where by at scale I mean more than one microservice per developer, they end up on the left because it's a simpler world, it's much easier to reason about. This is partly why people are so excited by Docker and things like it, because it lowers the cost of creating isolated operating environments like this.
But we also have to think about making changes. We do want to avoid breaking other services. When I make a change to a service and deploy it into production, the key thing I'm asking myself is, have I broken one of my consumers? That's often why people resort to releasing all the services together, because they say, I've tested these 10 services together. I know they work together, so I'll just release them all at once. And that process becomes enshrined as the way to do things. But that actually slows down. Um, how quickly you can get functionality out and makes for riskier deployments. But if I want to make a change to one service, in this example, I want to change the inventory service, the key thing is to understand is, have I broken my consumer? So if I deploy a new version of inventory, am I, is shipping still going to work in production? So the way actually we can validate that before deployment without having to do large end-to-end -end testing uh, and that's using a technique called consumer-driven contracts. If you think about this communication here, the shipping service has expectations on how the inventory service is going to behave. The issue is, is those expectations are often implicitly modeled. There are calls in the application code that we can sort of look through and say, OK, if we could distill that down, that's sort of the contract that we have. But that contract isn't explicit anywhere. What we do with consumer-driven contracts is we make that contract explicit and we make it executable. So we use, so we take the, con so the consumer team, for example, here, would create a set of tests that represent the expectations they have of the inventory service. Those tests are then run as part of the CI build of the inventory team. So every time I check in, I run my consumer-driven contract test. So maybe I bring up the inventory service on my CI node, I execute the expectations against it for the various different consumers I've got, and if one of them breaks, I know not only should I not go into production, but I even know which consumer I've broken. Uh, so this is a very good technique. We use this quite a lot now. Uh, there are some sort of test tools that can be jury-rigged to, to support this. There are a few concerns that are quite tricky in this area. Um, and so the tool I like a, a lot in this space is one called PACT, which is built from the ground up for this purpose. Um, uh, Beth, who runs a project, she's even got a project called PAC Broker, where you can store the expectations for multiple different versions, which means you can validate expectations for multiple different versions of the same consumer before going into production, which is actually something you often want to do. So it's well worth a look. Um, but this allows you to do independent, isolated testing of a service, validate you're not going to break consumers, and go into production without the need for big end-to-end -end testing. But the problem is sometimes you do actually need to break consumers. You don't want to do it, but you have to sometimes. The key thing here is if we want to embrace the idea of independent deployability, we can't force consumers to upgrade at the same time as we produce a new version of our service API. So we have to think about different models. One of the models I like a lot is actually just coexisting the endpoints. So I'm going to introduce a breaking change. And so what I do is I map existing API calls to my version 1 endpoint. This could be a different namespace with RPC, I don't, a different port even. Um, and so that's where my old traffic is going. I put my breaking API is a new version. It's version 2. And I expose that somewhere else, very cleanly identifiable. I then give my consumers time to upgrade. So once they've made the switch, which they could do is maybe a separate release in a few weeks from now, I can then retire the old endpoint. I've used this model quite a few times. I've even had that one time we had three different APIs exposed on one service to allow consumers time to upgrade. This works very well in terms of keeping your sort of deployments quite simple, keeping service discovery simple. And it works quite well when you've got a, a sort of control over your consumers. You have the ability to ask them at some point to upgrade to a new version. Another model you can use is when you introduce a breaking change is to actually reduce a brand, produce a brand new version of your customer service. So maybe I've got version one, I've got version two, and they're serving different consumers. That model works well when you can't change the consumer. They just need that API. Uh, the problem with having multiple different versions of a service live at once is those multiple different service versions are effectively branches in code. If I now have to fix a critical bug, I may now have to fix it in multiple different places. It also can complicate service discovery. I now need to find not just my customer service, but my particular version of a customer service. 
And if these services are also stateless, that can be a bit tricky. But nonetheless, a mix of coexisting endpoints like this and having multiple different versions of the same service are ways in which you can break an API without breaking your consumers. This, in, in a way, is sort of a version of the expand contract pattern. Once nobody's using an old version of my service, I turn it off. Once somebody's no longer using an old version of my API, I remove that code. Let's talk now about putting the consumer first. Services exist to be called. With a user interface, I suspect that most of us now are quite comfortable with the idea that it might be a good idea to have a kind of either a, a real user or a fake user look at our design and help us tweak and iterate that design. Some of you may have even done guerrilla testing, you know, going out there, having, watching people use your application, filming them while they're doing it, getting that great feedback. APIs are the same. APIs are a user interface. Their user is just another team. It's another set of developers. So you actually need to think, what is it I need to do to make it easy for them to actually work with my service? Services exist to be called. It's very unsexy. But one of the easiest things you can do to make your life easy is have good documentation. Swagger is winning, and if not, has won the battle in this space as a way of defining documentation for APIs. Uh, most web APIs you'll use will support exposing a JSON for this stuff. Um, this can be often a very easy thing to do. You put a little bit of information on your endpoints, and you can produce nice, shiny documentation. Swagger can go a bit further for you, because you can do things like use the Swagger UI to actually execute those endpoints for within your browser. If you think about the, you know, you're, you're as a person who's consuming this API, you kind of want to explore it, you want to understand how the payloads work. Being able to go to a Swagger UI like this, see the documentation, see example templates of what to execute, actually paste them in, change the fields and hit execute and maybe run against a developer version of that service, that's great feedback for, for actually someone writing a service to consume your API. Even other things can help too. Even knowing what's actually running out there can be useful. Um, many of you may have heard of service discovery tools. I don't tend to like using service discovery tools very early on because I think they're really about scale. But nonetheless, these sorts of systems give you information about what is running where. I tend to favor console in this space. This is something really, though, designed around having one machine talk to another machine, and not necessarily often very useful for human beings. But they do expose information that can be useful. As a consumer, I now could get hold of what's running where. Then all you need to do is a little bit of work and actually get that information out and present it in a nice fashion. Uh, a colleague of mine, um, Halvard, in Australia, coined this term of the humane registry. A registry not designed for other machines, but a registry designed for human beings. So he started off with a wiki page. If you've got information and documentation about your service via Swagger, I've got actual runtime dynamic information about my services held in something like a service discovery system, just create a wiki page for your service and pull that information into one place. As a consumer, I go to that page. I can maybe even find out even weird things like, who should I email when it doesn't work? You know, I've been in a few organizations where you, can't even, you don't even know who created this thing, and that's quite scary, believe me. But I can see the documentation, I can see how it's running, I can see you know, maybe even some stats. Creating things for human beings is quite important in the microservice world, and we'll touch on this idea of sort of making things easier to understand in a moment. Let's talk now about isolating failure. Um, it's an, inf an unfortunate uh, misunderstanding of distributed systems that some people have, but they sort of assume that just by breaking up, say, uh, a set of functionality across multiple machines, that your systems will automatically be more resilient. And it's actually not true. It's actually much easier to make things less resilient. Well, think about it, right? If your application is running across more machines, machines have a failure rate. There are now more machines in your system that could fail. There are more network boundaries. There are more network networks that could partition, that could time out. You've effectively expanded your surface area of failure. 
And so unless you've also built your application to handle that failure, your system will be less resilient. True story, a couple of years ago, I was working at a client. They'd taken a monolithic .NET application. They'd split it up into 12 pieces, and they were running this in production. And they said to me, Sam, whenever one of these services stops working, everything stops working. Uh, a, a friend of mine has likened this to a distributed single point of failure. Somebody else talked about it as being like you've taken your brain and chopped it up into 12 pieces and put it into 12 different jars. That system was a was you know had I, I, my suggestion was to merge it all back together because it probably be more resilient. The issue is they hadn't thought about what failure means. Now it's not just other people that do this. I also did this. Um, I was the lead on a uh, project a few years ago. This was for a classified ads website. They worked in multiple verticals, like you could buy a guitar and a cement mixer from them. And so they'd built up all these old legacy applications to support different verticals over time, and we were working to move these onto a new technology stack. And we used a pretty common migration pattern, actually a pattern you'll use a lot if you're looking to move towards microservices, and that's this idea of a strangler application. Effectively, a strangler application is something that intercepts calls to the old system um, and potentially redirects them to new. Uh, to the new code, and over time, you get rid of the old code until only really your new code exists. So in this example, we were proxying requests to the downstream applications, and that was fine. So for the verticals that got less traffic, that were less valuable to the organization, we were leaving those and focusing on where the money was. Um, around about 10 production nodes, um, normally we would have only about 30 to 60 concurrent requests at any given point in time. Uh, per node at peak, but we'd have about six to 8,000 requests per second coming in, but most of that was very aggressively cached. So these were the by design cache misses, effectively. Uh, the peak was during the day, which was very good for me, because during one of these peaks, the whole system went down. What happened was the load on these nodes went from having handling 30 to 60 requests to handling over 800 in space for 15 minutes. And when you've got a request equaling a thread, you get some idea about what might happen to circa 2009 era hardware. So the whole system went down, and went down very quick. It turned out this was an example of a cascading failure, the kind of thing you really need to protect yourself against. What was happening was that one of the downstream services was failing in the most annoying way anything can fail in a distributed system. And that was, it was failing slowly. When things fail slowly, they tie up resources. And in a distributed system, they have the potential to tie up resources across call chains. Of, therefore, you have multiple services that may have resources locked up. That's dangerous. And that actually took our system down. Because this thing was failing slowly, the thread pool that we were using to proxy calls became exhausted because all of the threads were blocked waiting for this thing to time out. The thread pool, therefore, had no more workers available, which was annoying because although the rest of the downstream applications were working just fine, no traffic could get through. And because the thread pool was full up, all the requests coming in from the outside world were still building up and were blocked and were hanging there waiting. So that was actually these requests coming at the top were what caused the huge spike in the number of concurrent requests and it took the whole system down. So this was just one of our applications, a very old one, that one day decided to be slow and this cascaded up and took out our entire system in 15 minutes. That's not good. So we fixed this in, a f in actually a few different ways, and these actually ended up, I didn't realize at the time, a, a fairly common set of patterns that you'll use to really you know, make these systems more resilient. The first thing we did was recognize that the timeouts were hopelessly wrong. We were waiting two minutes for these downstream services to respond. No human being, even in 2009, waits two minutes for a web page to load. So people that had requested a page had already gone off and done something else while we were still waiting on something to time out. So we really shortened those timeouts. We took them from two minutes to about two seconds. And the way you can do it is just look at the normal response time percentiles. And so we just stuck our timeouts in a fairly healthy place where like 90, our 90th percentile response was fine. We accepted that we might be aggressively timing out things. But the reality was the application that had started failing on us generated a very small amount of our traffic anyway. So we felt it was more important to keep the whole system running. 
So that's the first thing. You know, when you're thinking about timeouts, what are the timeouts? What should they be? So we brought those right down. But we realized even then, we still had a single point of failure, and that thread pull. Even if we could maybe put those threads back quickly, if we only had one thread pool for all of our downstream services, we still had the situation where traffic to one application, one downstream application, could stop traffic going to others. And so we added one thread pool per downstream application. This is an example of what's called bulk heading. It's a very important pattern in resilience engineering. The way to think about this is, you know, you've got a ship, big ship, you hit a rock, water starts pouring into the hull, if you go down into the hold, you close the compartment that's flooded. That compartment is flooded, but the rest of the ship carries on. So in this situation now, if one of these thread pools becomes exhausted, the other thread pools can still serve requests to the other downstream applications. That's good. The third thing we did was we added what are called circuit breakers. So the way circuit breakers work in a networking sense is just like they work in your house. You get a surge of electricity that comes to your house, the circuit breakers open, they stop the flow, they protect your appliances. Here, the way the circuit breakers work is after a certain number of errors or timeouts, the circuit breaker opens, and requests stop getting sent to the downstream service. That gives the downstream service the ability to recover if needed, especially if you've got, say, exponential backoff and retries. But it also allows your code to fail fast. Rather than waiting for a timeout or an error, I can say, the inventory service is down. That allows you to programmatically degrade functionality. So in our case, that meant that when a circuit breaker blew open, we would actually close off part of our user interface that related to that verticals or pop-up and error message. So now not only are you keeping the rest of the site running, you're keeping information flowing, you're, being, you're giving clear indication to the user what's happening. Um, circuit breakers are also useful not just for handling unplanned outage, they're also good for handling planned outage. You know, like you've got the your fuses in your house, before you start drilling in the walls, you open the circuit breakers to stop yourself electrocuting yourself while you're doing the drilling. So when we needed to deploy a new version of these downstream applications, we'd flick the circuit breaker open, the site would degrade functionality based on that service no longer being available, and we'd redeploy the new version, test it, you know, and then reset the circuit breaker. And so by putting in something that was there to deal with unplanned outage, we also gave ourselves a mechanism to handle near-zero downtime deployments. All three of these patterns are helpfully described in Mike Nygaard's book, Release It. If you buy one book this year, buy my book. If you buy two books this year, buy my book and Mike's book. Um, so it's a really excellent book around resiliency engineering. So this is the stuff you have to think about. These three patterns will come up time and time again, but you have to think what happens if every single thing that I, that I can do fails. And I would apply circuit breakers around database connections even as well. There are good libraries for this. You've got Hysterix for Java, you've got Poly and Brighter for .NET. Um, there's probably about 15 different implementations in Ruby, some of which may even work. So uh, just do your research on that one. But do read Mike's book as well. One to the last principle now, that of making things highly observable. Um, and I don't mean just in the sense of making it really easy for you to just look at all the machines you've got running. This is what I used to do. When I used to run production systems, I used to have lots of X terms open, lots of green on black text. It was great. I was running top. My, my favorite things would have top running on all of my machines. It's like I was in the matrix. I felt very, oh, it's great. Look, look what I'm doing. I'm supporting the systems. Um, and so if I wanted to check for logs, the errors on the logs, just every day or two, I'd, I'd log onto all the machines, do a grep for errors, and see if there's any odd patterns coming up. Um, and that's fine when you've got like six machines. And then we got more machines, and I was starting to have a real problem. I couldn't manage them anymore. So I got a second second monitor so I could have more windows open. That doesn't scale so well after a certain point in time. You end up really needing to move away from this idea that monitoring and observing and understanding system behavior is about logging into the machine. You need to be thinking about gathering all the information you can out of those nodes and storing it in one place where it can be viewed. So we're talking really about aggregation of all the things. Start off by getting logs out of your system. You know, if you've got money by Splunk, if you've got a lot of money by Splunk, it's awesome. Fantastic log aggregation tool. If you want something to host yourself using the Elk stack is great. If you want something you know, that's off-premise, you can use um, Paper Trail or, or Simo Logic. Just get all of your logs in one place. It makes it very, very easy for you to just see what's happening across your entire fleet. Most of those aggregation tools will also do things like you know, reporting on error rates and stuff like that, which can be really useful. Do the same thing with your stats. 
get things like the response rates off every single one of your machines, and so you can look at latency as well across your circuit breakers, get those off those nodes, get them somewhere central. Um, traditionally, you'd use something like Graphite. Um, if you're hosting it yourself, I'd go with Prometheus nowadays. Again, you know, New Relic, AppDynamics, any of those systems handle aggregation of stats really, in a really nice fashion. With its stats aggregation, what you're often looking for is being able to see things over time, so a good time series based system, and the ability to drill down. With aggregation, you want to see the overall pattern, but when you want to dive into what a particular service is doing or a particular machine is doing, you'll need to be able to navigate in. So often these systems will come with some kind of query language to make that possible. It's not just doing things like aggregation. We've also got to think about what, how, we, how services are connected to each other. We've got to make it easy for us to understand what's happening and how our systems are behaving. For example, I've got you know, some interconnected services. I click a button which calls a service, which calls a service, which calls a service. And all the way deep in that call stack, I get an error. As an application developer, I might have enough information about the call that was made to, that caused that error at the service itself. But will I understand the context in which that call happened? Will I understand all the other things that led up to that error happening? What if that error happened as part of a long-lived business transaction? I have now got to work out what's broken as a result. Do I need to unpick something manually? So here we're just reusing an old idea from event-based systems, and that's this idea of the correlation ID. So when I start some, some action, I click a button, for example, I generate an ID. That ID flows downstream. For every subsequent call, I record that correlation ID and some information about it. So um, some people use tools like Zipkin, which gives you tracing of latency across calls. I like actually just taking these correlation IDs and putting them into log files, because then I get a stack trace, I see the correlation ID, I put that into my log aggregation system, I can now see all the log statements related to all the calls through my entire call stack. This stuff is really, really useful. The unfortunate thing about correlation IDs is by the time you've got a system complicated enough to need them, the effort to put them in is non-trivial. Because by definition, you've got a complicated system. And so I actually often start off by saying, we are just going to come up with a convention, and we are going to put them in. It's going to be a header. Here's how we generate them. Here's where we expect to find them in the logs. And even starting that off with a simple system is going to be useful. One of my clients, who was a very um, overachieving sort of person, uh, came up with this really nice idea, which he used. Uh, he liked, you know, we were talking about this idea of data, logs as being like data. And so he wrote a little program that, given a correlation ID, would actually draw pictures of the services and how the services were communicating. You know, there's having a piece of documentation that says this service talks to this service, and then there's drawing pictures of it based on correlation IDs coming out of your live production logs. That stuff is just really useful. So let's summarize. Let's talk about our eight principles again. Modeling things around a business domain leads to services that have more stable API boundaries. It's easier to reuse them in different ways for different user interfaces. And it makes teams that own them experts, not just in the domain themselves, but also the service ownership themselves. And it avoids lots of cost-cutting changes. Embracing a culture of automation is key to allow you to manage all of these multiple different services that are flying around. Hiding implementation details is essential if you want to evolve the internals of one service without breaking others. Decentralize things. Avoid smart middleware. See if you can push decision making into your team. Lower the barriers to entry for teams to look after and manage things themselves. Deploy things independently. This is actually the golden rule. If the only thing you remember out of this presentation, actually, if there's only one thing, it's to buy my book. If there are two things you're going to remember, it's this. This is what you need to aim for. You need to be able to make a change to a service and deploy it into production in isolation of everything else. And if you can do that reliably, you're in a very good place. Place your consumer first. It's a very soft thing. Services exist to be called. Think outside in. Make sure you understand where your sources of failure are. Every single communication between one service and another is a potential place where something can go wrong. Plan for that, understand it, and know what you're going to do about it as a result. And finally, make sure you build your systems to be observable. You know, building things in like correlation IDs, aggregating stuff in a consistent and standard way is very important.
Uh, if you want more information about the book, you can find it at buildingmicroservices.com. There's a bunch of copies I signed that you can buy, and there's 40% off. Um, you can also find links to my blog, where I'm sort of blogging about um, new patterns and new research I've done subsequent to this. But um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think we've got some time for questions. I can't see anything, but you know, there's a question over there. You talked, uh, you talked about slicing things vertically. Yeah. Um, when you do that, what about the front end? Do you, uh, each service exposes its own front end, and if so, how do you integrate those? Or do you integrate on the front end itself? Like yeah. Uh, it's a really good question. So if you're slicing vertically, what do you do about the user interface? The, the challenge here is that user interfaces are normally fundamentally aggregations of functionality. Um, so I've seen a few different models. For organizations who's, who are primary delivering over the web, who are doing like old school, like not single page app built type websites, there's a very easy way to do that, which is your service serves up a collection of pages, and effectively then you just use a very, very thin scaffolding layer to sort of pull that stuff together. Um, and so that's sort of what Gilt do, um, that's what REA do. So effectively, you know, I work in this area, this is our part of the UI, and then you just have to have someone keeping an eye that it's all coming together correctly at the top. Uh, Orbits actually use microservices to serve up components in their pages that are then pulled together. Uh, things get tricky around mobile. With mobile, you can't often just be making loads of calls to these back-end microservices because that's very expensive because of battery, data plans, and the like. So you could do that with a single-page app, which I've also seen. So you make the call straight into the services. But when it comes to mobile, that's often not efficient. And so there's this pattern called the back-ends for front-ends idea, where you effectively have an edge service that is there to handle the server-side communication for a certain user interface. So you make coarse-grained calls to that back end for front end, that in turn makes the call to the microservices. The key thing there with that pattern is that BFF is tightly coupled to that user interface, often owned by that team, if that team's their mobile team. So uh, REA, for example, they've got one BFF for their Android app, they've got a different BFF for their iOS application. I've got a blog on that coming out, I think, next week, kind of a big piece that should go into a bit more detail, so I hope that was useful. Cool, question here. Yeah, so the question there was, if I've got a customer service, and I've got two different services that need different things from the customer, would the idea be here like that, they, that one is storing some set of information about a customer, and another is storing other information about the customer? Is that sort of the example? Yeah, you said that uh, they need this information from the customer, and the other yeah. information from the customer. Yeah, this is, a, this is this problem that with something like the customer is a fantastic example of often what doesn't make sense as a service in its own right. And I use the example a lot in the book, which is where it gets confusing. Um, I don't think it makes sense for the customer service to necessarily store all information about the customer, because if you follow the links, that could then be all of your data. Uh, the way I like to think about it is, uh, let's think of the British government. I'm always thinking about the British government. It's part of my patriotic duty. But if you go to the DVLA, they're the driving license authority. They store information about me, my car registration, my driving licenses. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs stores information about my tax returns, which, by the way, are late. And the NHS stores information about my medical health records. Now, they all have very, very different needs. I actually like the idea that they're not all in one place, because a lot of sensitive information. What they're working through now is this idea that but they're still me. I still have an identity. So this idea, effectively, that the information stored about me is almost federated in those different places. For something like a customer service on a very simple system, I might be inclined to have most of the information there. But over time, I think something like a customer service is actually going to store a very, very small bit amount of information about me, and maybe just enough to handle authentication, maybe just enough about my identity. But then those local services that have their own needs of your data, they might have a pointer to your identity in them, but they'll store their local records about you. And I think that's a very natural progression you get to when you go beyond, say, a more trivial systems. The customer, the customer, your user, is always a great example of where that thing comes up. But I hope that was useful.
I've probably got time for the question. What about shared data, for example, a name in your example? Yeah, um, What's the key change the name in, in your reason? What's the proper way to, uh, to replicate uh, or to, to synchronize between, uh, between stories? Uh, so how do you handle shared data? Um, I think very clearly. I understand if I've got a piece of information so if I'm copying data around, that's, I, I use caching for that. And so I have information about how often I will refresh that. I don't like copying other people's data and storing it in my database because it's not clear to me who owns what. And so I would use things, I would just not, you know, put cache headers on the resources I'm sending out, allow services to make decisions about whether or not they cache and re-request that information. And that's sort of how I would handle that. If you really, really, really need things to be consistent, then you can't cache, and in which case you have to go back to a consistent data source for that anyway. Um, so that's sort of your, your kind of trade-off. I am short on time, so I can't really explain that very, very well. I do talk about it in the book. Um, anyway, I got, I've got Christmas presents to buy. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, if you want to ping me questions, um, I'll try and do follow-up on uh, my Twitter handle, at, at Sam Newman. But I've now got to go to Brussels and hopefully get on a Lufthansa flight to Munich. So wish me luck. <laughs>